Welcome to the CEC Report for the 5th of May 2017. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is Craig Isherwood, CEC Leader. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And on this week's show, Trump looking at breaking up the banks, but will it be in time? And the pathway to a peaceful North Korea is closer than you think. So firstly today, Trump looking at breaking up the banks, but will it be in time? So there's been quite a debate in the United States over the idea of breaking up the two big to fail banks so that deposit taking banks cannot speculate threatening a new GFC, which is actually already upon us and we'll talk about that uh, today. That's why we're asking, will it be in time? Because he has to act fast. Now there have been a number of top representatives of the Trump team that have reaffirmed his support for Glass-Steagall legislation for breaking up the banks in recent weeks. But he has now uh, himself personally stated that he is looking at it very closely for the first time since he was actually inaugurated. Mm -hmm. And that was in a Bloomberg News interview on the 2nd of May where he, he was asked about um, whether he supported Glass-Steagall. He said, I'm looking into that right now. There's some people that want to go back to the old system, right? So we're going to look at that. Oh, and then one hour after the interview, his press secretary, Sean Spicer, uh, affirmed that that was his approach, that he'd met with the independent community bankers of America. And he said, Trump talked about it in the campaign. He's mentioned it before. Uh, we are not at a point where we're able to roll out details at this time, but he is actively considering options on it. I think the point that you made before, Elisa, about this has to be done now is totally crucial. Look, Glass-Steagall, for those new viewers that are watching us, is a policy that was introduced back in the 30s by Franklin Roosevelt. Glass and Steagall were the two representatives that drafted the legislation to break up the big banks back then. Because what had happened was that you had massive amounts of speculation in which caused the Great Depression because of the, the banking policies at that particular time. So what Glass and Steagall did under Roosevelt's guidance was to separate out the legitimate, necessary, boring commercial banking operations from the highly speculative merchant and investment banking operations. Today we've got the same, what's happened is that the Glass-Steagall Act was, was repealed in uh, 1999 under Clinton and consequently there's been an absolute mega feast mm -hmm. by the banks using depositors funds in order to speculate. So what President Trump is looking at doing is going back to the old Glass-Steagall legislation and saying, okay, we need to have a boring banking system, a normal commercial banking system, you check accounts, loans, mortgages, that sort of thing, and to protect those deposits as a, and, and break off the more speculative side of things, mm. like the merchant banking, investment banking. Because today <coughs> you've got merchant banking, investment banking, ordinary banking, stockbroking, house insurance agencies, it goes everything. on and on. Everything is piled into these too big to fail banks, they've speculated themselves silly, mm. they've had an orgy of speculation, they've built up an enormous debt bubble, both in you know what we call derivatives but also in corporate debts and so yeah. forth. Yeah, in fact everything that was done after the 2008 GFC to try to solve the situation has made it dramatically worse, um, in particular um, quantitative easing, lowering of interest rates down to zero and even negative interest rates in some cases. Um, this central bank pouring out of money has been picked up, not, it hasn't gone into the real economy. Mm. If it had have done, that would have been a step in the right direction. Instead, it's actually gone into more money spinning and gambling activities, as you mentioned. Mm. Um, so we want to take a bit of a look at the, a new debt bubble that's been built up in the United States and appears to be right at the bursting point. So in 2008 it was the mortgage and in particular subprime mortgage as the cutting edge of that bubble. Yeah. Today we have a corporate bubble. Now we're talking here about non-financial corporations, so not banks and so forth, but big corporations, big business in the United States. And we'll put up some graphs and show, tell you some figures. So you have um, it, within these non-financial corporations a debt worth 13 and a half trillion. Now in 2008 this was 8 trillion, so it's up 75 percent. Now since 2013, 80 percent of that debt was used for what's called financial engineering. So that's things like buying up your own stock to increase you know, the financials of your company. 
Um, and of course, with it comes a lot of other problems. Debt leverage has jumped. Debt to income ratios are at an all time high. And as you can see from the next figure here, the ability to pay even the interest on this debt from earnings, because profit is actually not rising in this circumstance, um, so the ability to pay interest is also collapsing. Um, a lot of these companies find they can't borrow more to service their debt because one of the things that is now happening is that the banks are putting the brakes on credit because they can see the corner has been turned. You have a default rate um, at the start of last year, it was 3%. It's already now 5% and rapidly rising. Uh, and <clears throat> the default rate for subprime corporate debt, so that's on the, you know, the dodgy end of this debt bubble, has more than doubled in one year, and that's in the next figure up on the screen now. Uh, there's a new IMF report that just came out, and it kind of draws the conclusion from all of what we've just been through, that 20% of all US corporations could default if interest rates climb sharply. Now, basically this bubble is, is bigger than the mortgage bubble was in 2008. That was 1.5 trillion. The subprime corporate debt today is 2 trillion. So you've got this massive bubble, which is just literally waiting to burst. And if action is not taken to actually separate out and clean out the banking sector, we're in big trouble because we have less capability to deal with this today. We have banks that are 40% on average bigger than what they were. The two big to fail banks swallowed up. There was a couple of thousand smaller banks that went bust during the GFC in America. Mm -hmm. They've swallowed them up. They've gotten too big to fail. Um, we have to unravel this now, Craig. Yeah, well, look, the, the issue here, though, is really this, this, this new corporate debt bubble because this is something that's just come to our attention because it's been reported by the IMF saying that if there is this interest rate increase of just a few percent, you're going to see 20 percent of the corporations in the United States go under. That's, that's un unbelievable. That's much, much bigger than the housing yeah. crisis issues of 2008. See, Alyssa, what happens is companies, when they don't have enough money uh, or can't you know, issue more shares, they will issue bonds. They'll issue debt. They'll say to the public and to you know, unwitting buyers, we have got these, uh, we'll issue these bonds, you know, maybe $100,000. That's a small one. If you want that bond, we'll, we'll guarantee that to pay that back in 10 years or five years or whatever, and we'll pay interest on that. But what they've done is they've gone, you know, again, they've just issued much, much more debt and at the same time, instead of investing in new plant and machinery and mm. stuff, they've been fiddling around with the financial markets trying to get good returns back. So one of the things that they've done is use that money to buy back their own shares. So existing shareholders get a bigger dividend. That in turn drives the share market up because the share price increases because people can see that, you know, uh, well, they, they do get dividends on those shares, right? And that's why the U.S. stock stock market has gone up over twenty thousand. Mm. I mean, you want to talk about a self-feeding yeah. bubble. And at the base of this, you've got very, very cheap credit coming out of the banks, from the Federal Reserve, from the past quantitative easing. All this credit's been fed into this bubble, this corporate debt bubble, that has uh, you know allowed uh, you know people to buy these 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 bonds of these corporations. So it's it's a big messy. Uh, bubble mm -hmm. and one that's about to burst mm -hmm. and it'll, it, this is bigger than the, the global financial crisis mm. you know, and the interest rates have already started the upward moves in the united states of course at the same time as it blows the corporate debt bubble there the impact it has on our interest rates as we showed on last week's program um, most people couldn't handle an extra hundred dollars mm. on their mortgage repayments um, so the rising interest rates here, you're going to have that blowing simultaneously. So we really have to get on top of this. Um, yeah. Now, we've got a full article explaining and detailing this corporate bubble in this week's Australian Alert Service. So for those who haven't contacted us to get involved, ring in and we'll send you a complimentary copy of that and you can read all the details in there. So we'll take a quick break, but we'll keep talking about Glass-Steagall after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing the fact that Trump has 
said he is looking at Glass-Steagall, at laws to break up the big banks, which is good news. And actually, it does make a big difference that Trump comes out and says that. Um, the senior editor of a Capitol Hill newspaper called Roll Call, David Hawkins, was on um, Washington DC radio the other day, and he made the point that Glass-Steagall could become one of the top legislative items in the Congress literally overnight if the Trump administration makes a very clear and public call for this. Um, now, Trump hasn't done that yet. He has indicated we are moving with this. So he's saying, you know, we're backing up our campaign promises. But what he should do in light of what we just laid out about this corporate debt bubble that's about to burst is he should actually tell the Congress, because there's legislation on the floor of the US Senate, on the floor of the House of Representatives, he can actually say to the leaders of both houses, get this ready, we need this through. And if, were he to do that, it could be by the next by the time we do the next show, it could be in place. I think Alyssa also it's important to mention at this point, this is the Glass Steagall is just one aspect yeah. of the program. It's just to re regulate the banking system and stop the speculation. Now when you're talking about corporations, like large corporations which do have some manufacturing attached to them, they're not just going to be able to stop their operations there, they have to. Ha they actually have to have a means by which to move forward. Mm. And this is why we at, we in the CEC and the International Research Organization say that we need to have a national bank, a, a national bank that's created and run by the government because presently the government has completely uh, abrogated its responsibility towards the banking in, in this country and other countries and has basically said the private banks can do what they wish. Mm -hmm. Now that means that we have got no real, no real control over how we create the credit. Now if you had a national bank that creates the credit, then you'd say, okay, we need to have large scale infrastructure projects, very much like what's being done with the new Belt and Road Initiative that China's driving, large scale infrastructure that creates the demand for new goods and services that can be produced by these large companies. So these companies go back from being these speculative vassals full of corporate debt. Trying to show a profit. Trying to show a profit through speculation mm -hmm. into actually producing mm -hmm. real goods. So that this process of creating that uh, that, that wealth, that that uh, that, that um, you know, new infrastructure and new activities, you know, Trump's committed to a one trillion dollar infrastructure program as well. But that's vital in order to be able to get out of this uh, this speculative bubble because you can't just stop everything all of a sudden and say, okay, well, we're going to have a glass steagall. There has to be a multifaceted approach. And I think that that's, there's a real weakness in this country that we talk about infrastructure, but it's always yeah. devoid of. A, a, a complete package. Yeah, it's looking at different piecemeal ideas, a gas pipeline here, an expansion of the snowy, and you know, they're good ideas, but it's not going to happen without the top-down approach, as you say. Um, now, re regarding Glass-Steagall, there is some good motion in Australia, and actually we have found that it's the topic of quite a debate amongst parliamentarians um, and other, you know, some parliamentarians even approaching us for more information about this subject. One of the big reasons being they see how much support and traction it's getting in the United States. And of course, if it were to come in here, what, what would it mean? Mm. And one indication of that um, was a poll that was done by Galaxy Research, which came to our attention a week or so ago. And uh, this was a poll asking people what issues concern them and in particular about their attitudes towards the banks. And then there were questions about Turnbull and Shorten's approaches to dealing with the concern about bank activities um, that have been questionable. And so I'll just give you a bit of a sense of some of the questions that were on this poll. Um, do you think breaking up the banks in Australia is a, and there's a multi-choice, bad idea, good idea, don't know? Uh, and then it goes into a series of several quite detailed questions such as what do you think breaking up the banks means and it gives a number of options which are discussing splitting up different aspects of bank activity, uh, making sure the banks make less profit, uh, preventing banks from acquiring or taking over other banks. So there's a whole um, sort of smorgasbord of things there that would just confuse people I would think. Uh, and then it says what do you think breaking up the banks should involve? Would you think each one is a good idea or a bad idea? So there's various uh, things they go through similarly, like a smorgasbord there. And then finally, uh, question 
Breaking up the banks might result in a variety of things. Here are some possible results. Do any of these worry or concern you? And this is where it becomes a bit of a push poll in the sense that it's putting the worries of, oh, this could happen or that could happen. And they're mainly um, related to the fact that they talk about smaller banks. So mm -hmm. this resolving the too big to fail comes back to, oh, the banks are going to be smaller and therefore they may be less able to invest in new technology, less able to make loans, they might need to raise interest rates, their share prices would fall, you know, you might get less of your dividends, etc. Um, banks would not be able to raise as much money from overseas investors. So there they're just putting out all the fears of what could be associated with such an approach. But I think it's very, very interesting whether this is being done by big banks whether this is someone like the Labor Party putting out the feelers to see if there would be support for such a policy, we don't know. Um, we do know there's general support from uh, across the board of parties for, at the very least, a banking royal commission. And that was expressed by um, the head of the Greens, Richard Di Natale. And he actually responded the other day to our change.org petition. And you should go to our website if you haven't uh, or go to change.org, search Glass-Steagall, you'll see where you can sign it because every time somebody signs, he and a bunch of other politicians get an email about it. So we've got nearly a thousand and he responded. Uh, he said, it is time to overhaul our banking sector. Profits are obscene. Competition has died. Misconduct is rife. Uh, the Greens were the first to push a Royal Commission into the banks. He said, all we need is one more coalition MP to cross the floor and vote for the Greens legislation. Tell your friends and family who live in coalition seats to contact their MP and urge them to stand up for a parliamentary commission of inquiry into banking and financial services. Uh, Lisa, this is, as I said before previously on the show, that's not the issue. The issue is you have to have a, a, a basic, what we call a Procura Commission, which was what was done in Roosevelt's time. And he used that as the impetus to get Glass-Steagall because the Procura Commission actually jailed some bankers. And if you're not prepared to jail bankers for their criminal activity, then the, the com commission is a complete waste of time. And in a sense, you're reinventing the wheel. We know what the problems are. I mean, the, the, the issue has to be clear legislation for like Glass-Steagall, separate the banks and then go with this other, you know, go with the National Bank. And the government actually has to take back the responsibility for controlling the private banking system. Mm. This was done during the war under Curtin Chifley, has been done before, because when you allow the private banks to put their private profits or their private shareholders ahead of the general welfare of the community, that is the general welfare which is supposed to be the role of government that mm -hmm. are elected by the people, then what you end up with is a mess that we have now, you know, total speculation on the verge of collapsing the entire global financial system. You have a housing bubble of which only a small correction in interest rates upwards would see many, many tens of thousands of people literally foreclosed upon. That mess is a mess of the private banking system. It's also a problem that's come about because the politicians of this country for decades, I mean absolute decades, mm -hmm. have abrogated their responsibility towards saying we are the government, we are responsible for, for, for banking policy. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about another royal commission? We not, go back to the 1930s royal commission. This, the issues are the same, mm. right? So I mean that's that's where we stand on if, this. And if I mean if they have a parliamentary commission, that would likely be better. Where, where they have a full inquiry, where it is basically like a court case, and that's what it would have to be. Where okay, you know, we just lay out um, every X, Y, Z. These are the crimes. Now, what's the consequences going to be? Without something like that, it won't work. Now. Um, we're going to take a quick break and afterward we're going to talk about one way which Australia can get back on track with what you've been suggesting, Craig, to put our nation first, which will also play a key role in dissolving the war situation and the crisis in North Korea, surprisingly enough. Welcome back to the CEC Report. The pathway to a peaceful North Korea is closer than you think. Now, um, there's a conference coming up in Beijing. This has been organised and sponsored by China and they've been actively organising for it for some time called the Belt and Road 
International Forum for Cooperation and that's taking place on the 14th and 15th of May and we've just put out a press release yesterday saying that our Prime Minister should attend, the Trade Minister Steve Chobo will be going, um, but we have not um, dedicated enough attention to this in this country. We should be allying with this proposal for uh, the new Silk Road which is not only a series of railway lines and new ports and opening up whole new trade routes, uplifting countries that will become new trade partners which extends from Asia through into Europe, down into Africa and which Australia could be a big part of through the Maritime Silk Road but it's also to bring countries together to cooperate which can forge cultural connections and bring peace and basically North and South Korea in the early 2000s we were very close to reunifying when you had Kim Dae-jung in power uh, in uh, South Korea and in the North you had Kim Jong-il and by 2002 because you had the World Cup taking place in South Korea and people wanted to travel from China through North Korea to the South they had proposed, this was just a, a means to say well let's finally do this, let's reunify and the demilitarised zone was opened up and they started to actually rebuild the railway connections that had been severed but it was also part of a bigger framework of what our organisation was proposing of the new Silk Road and that wasn't t happening at the time but today it actually is happening and so there is good news in the sense that although it's been at a real knife's edge in recent weeks just in the last week or so Trump has actually said that he would be willing under certain conditions to meet with the North Korean leader Kim, Kim Jong-un. He has also had a phone conversation with Putin despite all the attempts to sabotage cooperation between Russia and America uh, on the 2nd of May and they agreed to work towards a diplomatic solution. Um, there's probably never been a better prospect for a solution actually because you have China working very closely with uh, America whereas you know that at that 2002 period that I described, the Bush-Cheney government had just came in. Bush declared the axis of evil, which was Iran, Iraq and North Korea. And they were using North Korea as a means to provoke something with China. And they wanted to encircle, militarily encircle China, which was extended by Obama with the Asia pivot. Mm -hmm. So now we have a chance where Trump's willing to work with Russia and China to get new six-party talks, which involves also Japan, um, to begin to actually have peace on the peninsula. But um, this Belt and Road is also the key thing for Australia, and we, our ignoring it is not going to help the prospects of peace anywhere for the world. Yeah, despite at least four invitations by the President of China, the Prime Minister of China and so forth, our government has literally turned its back on. This is our largest trading partner. Yeah. We're in this region, and, you know, look, at China has 20,000 kilometres of high-speed rail, and we haven't got one yet. Now, we could build high-speed rail between Melbourne and Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra, Canberra and Sydney, Sydney to Brisbane. This could be done in a very quick way if we were to partner with some of the Chinese firms that are, that are building high-speed rail, rail in, in China. But now, these, these sorts of ideas, when you, when you look at the attitude of our foreign minister towards, South, towards North Korea, you see the British hand all over this, Elise, mm -hmm. which is this idea of a zero-sum game. There has to be a winner and there has to be a loser. Well, the Chinese idea of Xi Jinping is a win-win solution. That If we cooperate, all our countries can win together. And I think that that's what President Trump is starting to embrace. And you see this in his move. And that absolutely freaks the hell out of the hmm. British, who are already preemptively you know, forecasting war in a lot of the British tabloids, because yeah. they are terrified that any sort of unification between China, Russia and the United States, but particularly the United States and Russia, would see the end of the you know, the cold, post-Cold War uh, hostilities. That's right and if Trump were to actually attend this conference in Beijing, which he still may, he's not scheduled to, but you never know, um, but America joining in with this land bridge perspective would just transform the entire planet and would be actually very difficult to make war when you have nations cooperating and working together. But as always we've run out of time so call in for a free copy of our alert service and tune in again next week.